All right, cool. Uh, the Spirit of Terrorism. So this text gained Baudrillard some infamy. Judging, well, not judging, but as can made as is made clear by the fucking title of it, it wasn't exactly received well by everyone, um, and it didn't really have a place in the kind of political narrative uh, post 9/11. It couldn't be taken up really by the right or the left because it was, it, you know, he's a very enigmatic thinker, uh, especially when he's talking about certain things like symbolism or the idea of the symbolic, and I use that in air quotes, which are some ideas that are, that'll come up here. Um, but I think that it speaks to, and I'm prefacing this by saying that it doesn't have a clear, um, it can't, it can't be clearly mobilized by a pl- political party as we understand it, how they can manifest themselves today, at least in the United States or North American context. Um, it just totally blows up these categories, at least in my mind. So on that, you know, jump into it. So beginning this book, he writes that, or I'll just read it. Um, when it comes to world events, we had seen quite a few from the death to Diana to the World Cup and violent real events from wars right through to genocides. Yet when it comes to symbolic events on a world scale, that is to say not just events to gain worldwide coverage, but events that represent a setback for globalization itself, we had had none. So these, I think, are the types of events that uh, pose a challenge to the system, and that is the system of globalization for him here. Um, And this comes out in a number of different forms throughout his, uh, his work, right? The one that most people would be aware of, I think, would be the idea of the simulacrum, which I think has a very strong connection to the project of globalization, because the simulacrum is the moment when things become more real than real. But we must ask, what does that reality look like? Is it a reality that corresponds to the reality of everyone on Earth, or is it a very set uh, reality? To which I would say it's most likely the latter, precisely because throughout Baudrillard's work, he's highly skeptical of the way that it is, or not skeptical, but he um, wants to caution against the way that the simulacrum is, high, is associated with scientific rationality and how these two go hand in hand at least in the sense that objective materialism is for Baudrillard a kind of uh, trompe l'oeil, just uh, an idea that the simulacrum mobilizes to convince people that it's more real than real. It It's real because it can be quantified, it can be validated, it can be proved via, you know, the scientific method or whatever. So when he's writing, what he's writing here is thinking about a way in which, or events that pose a challenge to that idea or pose a challenge to that universal globalized logic. So for him, 9-11 was the event in that way, or what he calls an absolute event. That is the event that made up for all the non-events that have occurred or the events that have not occurred. That is events that posed a challenge to the global, I guess, framework. So, as we can get the impression here, uh, Baudrillard was, he's really complicated in this way because he doesn't exalt terrorists, but he sees a certain validity behind these actions because he's worried, and we have to jump back a little bit here, uh, to another one of his books where he says in Fatal Strategy, so from the early 80s, that he fears not terrorism as much as he fears a state capable of ending terrorism. So that is for him the real threat. And that is for him what he wants to get at or what he sees as uh, coming out in, in, in with 9-11. But what for us might seem to be a you know an awful act, right? And it absolutely was. There's no denying that. Baudrillard says in his very exorbitant way that in many ways we have all dreamed of this event. That is, that is 9-11. So what he says is that the fact that we have dreamt of this event, that everyone without exception has dreamt of this event, because no one can avoid dreaming of the destruction of any power that has become hegemonic to this degree, 
is unacceptable to the Western moral conscience. Yet it is a fact, and one which can indeed be measured by the emotive violence of all that has been said and written in the effort to dispel it. So this is one of the, I think, one of the guiding principles throughout Baudrillard's work, where there, there are simultaneously two things going on throughout. Whenever you're reading Baudrillard, always assume that the opposite is occurring than what he is saying. So when he's describing a globalized total system, he's also going to make reference to the impossibility of that totalization. When he's talking about power, he's also going to talk about the impossibility of that power. So this kind of sets up, you know, his critique of Foucault, who he believed um, without taking into consideration the way that power often fails, simply um, revitalizes power. So by giving power all this credit, you know, in creating the carceral state or in, you know, putting people in this kind of panoptic subject model, uh, Baudrillard says that Foucault is really, you know, placing power on a pedestal, essentially giving it more power than it really has, you know, yeah. So in the context of what I just read, when we have a, are confronted with a global power, uh, that global power, despite its, you know, uh, I guess its ubiquity, will always come into contact with its own collapse. It might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but eventually it'll arrive there. Precisely because, and as Baudir says at another point, um, globalization will be stopped by the world itself. The world won't allow it, quite simply. So the Twin Towers represented this global framework. And this is not a new idea for Baudrillard. Back in the mid-70s, he wrote something very similar. And to just kind of jump to that, this is out of the book Symbolic Exchange and Death. So for those that aren't familiar with it, you don't really need to know the context but to, to get this, but here it is. Why has the World Trade Center in New York got two towers? All Manhattan's great buildings are always content to confront each other in a competitive verticality from which there results an architectural panorama that is the image of the capitalist system, a pyramidal jungle, every building on the offensive against every other. The system itself can be spotted in the famous image of the New York uh, we have of New York on arriving by sea. This image has changed completely in a few years. The effigy of the capitalist system has passed into the pyramid to the punch card. The buildings are no longer obelisks, but trustingly stand next to one another like the columns of a statistical graph. So a little bit further on, uh, this architectural graphism belongs to the monopoly. The World Trade Center's two towers are perfect parallelipedes, 400 meters high on a square base. They are perfectly balanced and blind communicating vessels. The fact that there are two identical towers signifies the end of all competition the end of every original reference. Paradoxically, if there were only one, the World Trade Center would not embody the monopoly, since we have seen that it becomes stable in a dual form. For the sign to remain pure, it must become its own double, this double of the sign really put an end to what it des designated. So we could say he might be wrong about the it not containing the monopoly, because now there's only one tower, I believe, uh, and it, I think it, the monopoly is still there, but you know, aside from that, he, he did have a little bit of a prophetic um, image of the World Trade Center there. And I think that he was really spot on when he was describing it as uh, the end of all competition, precisely by its kind of illusory uh, or the doubleness presents an illusory kind of choice, right? Like how, you know, political uh, parties for some only presents an illusory uh uh, choice when in fact you know it's two sides of the same coin so this represents something of a tautological system that only makes reference to itself so what we have then is a kind of autopoiesis so autopoiesis is the idea that you have a system that thrives in and of its in and of itself it doesn't rely on exterior components to keep itself going and this is a concept used in like uh, cell biology or, or something like that um, or autopoiesis allows the system or cell or whatever to propel on its own without intervention from the outside. 
So when we have a system like this, and if we follow the other proposition that I laid out earlier, that for Baudrillard, two things are always occurring. That is, you have a system that is perfect, but then it's also you know, going to come up against its end. Then we can say that this act, in the case of 9-11, did not occur from outside. It was in fact, and as Baudrillard said, the West, in the, in the position of God, has become suicidal and declared war on itself. So this is where we get one of his other quotes that uh, the World Trade Center committed suicide because they are the representatives of this global system that, according to Baudrillard, must always come into contact with its end, lest it, you know, you know, present something even more disastrous. Because for him, if we were to live in a perfectly total system without negativity, without opposition, without antagonism, we would actually be cast in a situation much more dire than that of constant threat or constant upheaval and constant renewal. So this portends his uh, some of his arguments around um, disease. So in some other, one of his last books, in fact, I think it is his last one, he uh, thinks about the way that AIDS and cancer are two phenomena that aren't totally random. They are, in fact he says, extensions of the same system that we find ourselves in, but that's that's for another day. Uh, but to kind of, you know, riff on that for a second, it is necessary for us to always come into contact with our own end or with our own uh, possible end, lest we enter a system that is, you know, kind of like Brave New World or, uh, you know, purely dystopian nightmare that for Baudrillard would be much worse than the alternative. So when these arguments or so many arguments are thrown around about this being uh, a conflict between religions or a conflict between nations, what we are doing, and, you know, he was writing this in 2002, so obviously those conversations were at their height then, and they really haven't gone away much. Um, All that does is uh, take us away from the real dilemma, and that is that no power will not, no power will not corrupt No power will not come up against its antithesis in some way. So when you have a global power, there are always going to be insurgent factions that rise up against it, whether it be in any form. You are going to have these examples that resist that globalization. So if we always frame it as being a, uh, a problem between nations or religions or anything like that, what we are doing is forgetting that, and it's a very clever strategy, really, because it's, it's like a red herring. It throws us off the scent of the real dilemma, and that is the, you know, the global project of the West. Or in Baudrillard's words, with each succeeding war, we have moved further towards a single world order. Today, that order, which has virtually reached its culmination, finds itself grappling with the antagonistic forces scattered throughout the very heartlands of the global in all the current convulsions. So war proper doesn't exist anymore because we know what the consequences would be if war broke out. Like as soon as nukes start flying, we can assume that that'll that'll be the that'll be it. So we try to resurrect war through our image centers, through our media, you know, and this was kind of the basis for his exploration into the Gulf War not taking place because it was a simulated war. It was a war intended to provide the semblance of a war in order to convince us that war hasn't disappeared. So with that being said, he says that a confrontation so impossible to pin down that the idea of war has to be rescued from time to time by spectacular set pieces, such as the Gulf War or the war in Afghanistan, because war as it was once understood shared much more of an affinity with what Baudrillard calls the symbolic exchange or the symbolic challenge and death than we know today because he believes these things have been effectively conjured away so from the other the book i read that passage i read from it symbolic exchange and death baudrillard suggests that both symbolic exchange and death have been eradicated kind of conjured away out of this system because they are not uh, they don't correspond to what he calls the law of equivalence or the structural law of value that we rely so heavily on. So to kind of put that, you know, quickly, uh, 
that is the idea that you always have a kind of quantifiable fixed ratio between different things. This is facilitated with the introduction of capital and capitalism more specifically um, because capital comes before like money comes anyways, uh, where you have certain dollar amount correspond to various things which is easy for us to understand. It makes sense. How do you attribute value to something like death then? Whereas at one time, Baudrillard suggests that, you know, you'd have something like a sacrifice that fueled the sun or would fuel the crops or would do anything like that. Now we have lost our ability to go outside of the domain of equivalence that is be between two separate yet commensurable things that it, like money and goods uh, to think about the way that value can come out of other domains as well, like the symbolic. So this is why suicide bombing is so interesting for Baudrillard, because that's for him the most literal way for another opposing system or opposing idea to instill death back into the equation, to say that this th death means a lot, and we're going to show you fuckers how much it means. So for him... He says that they have succeeded in turning their own deaths into an absolute weapon against a system that operates on the basis of the exclusion of death, a system whose ideal is an ideal of zero deaths. Now, of course, this logic of zero deaths only applies to one side. The logic of zero deaths would be applied to a system that uses, for instance, drone strikes as they were used so heavily under the Obama administration, uh, where, sure, no allied forces are losing lives, but, you know, you have however many civilians and other kinds of casualties at the hands of an enemy they, they, they can't even see. It's not there. It's almost, it's unreal, right? So in the wake of this logic of zero deaths and the whole kind of spectacular project around depicting uh, wars in a, in a certain light, right, uh, Baudrillard suggests that terrorism, because they draw the spectacle like nothing else, is an attempt to some extent to uh, push the system to collapse, to push it to its paroxysm. So it would do that by turning back on the system and saying, okay, you like the spectacle? We'll give you the spectacle. And then hoping by, you know, participating in that same logic that it can push it to its climax. So this is what, this is how he says it. This is the it is the tactic of the terrorist model to bring about an excess of reality and have the system collapse beneath that excess of reality. But for him, it you know it ultimately doesn't work because the system is much too crafty to to fall for something like that. It simply consumes that energy and uses it to you know propel itself and to keep the narrative going that you know this is a battle of ideals or this is a battle of religions or anything like that. So what the terrorist ultimately does for Baudrillard, I think, is maintain a certain degree of ambiguity because the terrorist act is never, it can't be mapped, it can't be understood, it can, it's rarely ever predicted, um, or maybe it is and people, you know, the ones in power who have some kind of arcane knowledge um, choose not to act on it because they see the, you know, how good it is to have these acts occurring unless we enter a more oppressive system but that's pretty conspiratorial of me um but anyway it does <laughs> terrorism doesn't correspond to some kind of mappable phenomenon it can't be understood so for that reason it maintains something of um indeterminacy something of an illusion something of um uh kind of an aleatory nature of reality that Baudrillard likes Baudrillard thinks okay what is at stake here in our simulacral world is the loss of, of these things in favor of pure operationality. So without this, there's the risk that we will go from, you know, just death as a thing that occurs to more oppressive things like the next final solution or the next mass annihilation or genocide or anything like that, um, which is, I th you know, possible because especially in the age of nuclear weapons and biotechnology that can very easily do away with populations, um, it's not really surprising that 
that might be a possibility. Now, is he paranoid? Yes, absolutely. Is he um, reductive and does he disavow uh, the suffering that comes at the cost of a so-called symbolic way of being? Yes, but I think he's on to something when he says that maybe we got to pump the brakes on this a little bit lest we enter a phase with our whole arsenal of weapons. We enter a phase where we might actually feel like using them. And what better time to use them than after however many years of us belonging to the logic of zero deaths while, you know, killing people overseas without feeling anything. So that can only go so far before, you know, even worse things happen. At least that's that's how I read them. So to return to 9-11 again, Baudrillard says in another part in this book that um, there was an odd moment, right? And I think we can all remember it for those that were alive during 9-11. I remember it. Um, When the first plane hit, right, it was a tragedy. Like, that's all it was. It it was like a terrible event that was totally coincidental. But when the second one hit, then it was, you know, then it became a calculated thing, which is an interesting phenomenon because without the second plane imagine like what would it have been anyways so on that because he can put it in much better words than me uh he says that their destruction itself respected the symmetry of the towers a double attack separated by a few minutes interval with a sense of suspense between the two impacts after the first one could still believe it was an accident Only the second impact confirmed the terrorist attack. And in the Queen's air crash a month later, the TV stations waited, staying with the story in France for four hours, waiting to broadcast a a possible second crash live. Since that did not occur, we shall never know whether it was an accident or a terrorist attack. So there was a necessity for these two towers, the towers to collapse. Because as he says, the the collapse of the towers is the major symbolic event. Imagine they had not collapsed, or that only one had collapsed. The effect would have not been the same at all. The fragility of global power then would not have been so strikingly proven. And just think, like this was uh, a moment when America was brought to its knees with by a few men with uh, box cutters, uh, what, however they did it, um, that were able to essentially bring down the America's, uh, I guess, market economy. (laughs) So I'm going to digress here. Uh, You know, it's probably, I shouldn't, but whatever. But this all reminds me very much of Graham Hancock, uh, who does a bunch, shows up online a lot. And he's written all those books about, uh, you know, the possibilities of Kind of, some kind of super civilizations that have been wiped out in the past, like 12, 13,000 years ago. And I think reading Baudrillard here, like that's not impossible because Baudrillard is in many ways predicting the same will happen to us. So one of the things that Graham says uh, is that there were many events occurring around the world, you know, around 10,000 or 13,000 years ago or so, or sorry, things way before then where there are these monuments being erected and all these types of things happening that according to our basic archaeological knowledge now shouldn't have been happening. So he suggests there may have been this civilization that was uh, more advanced than the other ones that we don't have any traces of because of some cataclysmic event, which I it, maybe it doesn't need to be a cataclysmic event. It probably just imploded, according to Baudrillard's logic here. Uh, but anyways, where he says that just as today, you know, there are people living in jungles that have no knowledge of the outside world, and we have no knowledge of them. Uh, if there were to be some kind of cataclysmic nuclear, I guess, holocaust, then who's going to survive? It'll be those people there. Uh, so I see in many ways a similarity here between that or what Graham says and what Baudrillard is saying. But Baudrillard is predicting this before it'll even happen. Uh, 
Because if Graham is right, then we may very well be on the same track to disappearing, where just those people in the jungles or those people considered to be, in air quotes, like not as developed, just some kind of racist jargon, are going to be the ones that, you know, are not subject to the same terrible phenomenon or not terrible cataclysm and will survive. But anyways, I digress. So to go back, thinking about terrorists, once again, Baudrillard considers that the uh, phenomenon of terrorism knows, or terrorists know, that there's no way they can really overthrow, you know, the global power. It's too strong. It's it's too big to fail. So, he, he, you know, Baudrillard, contemplating this, he says, okay, well, maybe their goal is not to overthrow the system. He says that, but perhaps this is the terrorist dream, the dream of an immortal enemy. For if the enemy no longer exists, it becomes difficult to destroy it. A tautology, admittedly, but terrorism is tautological, and its conclusion is a paradoxical syllogism. If the state really existed, it would give a political meaning to terrorism. Since terrorism manifestly has none, though it has other meanings, this is proof that the state does not exist, and that its power is derisory. So I'm going to jump ahead here and read, read another little part. This is the sovereign hypothesis. Terrorism ultimately has no meaning, no objective, and cannot be measured by its real political and historical consequences. And it is, paradoxically, because it has no meaning that it constitutes an event in a world increasingly saturated with meaning and efficacy. So terrorism responds to the system that is totally meaningful, right? It's a system of transparency, of objectivity, of facts, and terrorism not abiding by any of that, by extension, then becomes a, an event, then becomes something that stands out by virtue of it not complying to the same ubiquitous logic of the system. So in this banality that we find ourselves in, that is a banality of uh, prof the profusion of images, a banality of extension over or longevity over quality of life, stuff like that. Uh, Baudrillard says that we are see we see actually a reversal of the old paradigm. And what is that old paradigm? Well, it's as follows: In the past, the master was the one who exposed who was exposed to death and could gamble with it. The slave was the one deprived of death and destiny the one doomed to survival and labor. So Baudrillard says that we occupy the position of the slave in this situation, which is hard to swallow, right? Because you think, or we might think, that you know, the quote-unquote West are those people that hold power. And because they hold power, therefore, they are masters. But this power has in some ways, for at least I think what Baudrillard is getting at throughout, I think, all of his work, what this power has culminated into is a kind of euphoric state uh, where we are put in a kind of comatose uh, state of consciousness where we are dripped reality in homeopathic doses to give us the semblance of being you know alive so the image that the matrix the film gives us is is apt even though there are a number of problems with it uh, in relation to a Baudrillardian reading which I is for another day uh, but the image of humans being used as batteries and given a kind of simulated world to live in is in a sense what I think Baudrillard is getting at here, although it's a little different. So we are kept in a state of suspension, a kind of state of, um, yeah, state of suspension works, but we are also caught by the, you know, looming threat of nuclear, uh, kind of nucle the nuclear warheads going off. And by virtue of that fact, we are then what he calls hostages to this system. And by our being hostages to the system, and no one is above it, everyone is at the same level of risk. By virtue of that, we have entered a phase or a state of non-being to some extent, where we are by our lives being, you know, simply a gift almost every day by our not having blown up or having the world through the climate change just completely ruin us. We are then, uh, we aren't living a life as we once would. We are living in a state of suspension and longevity. Uh, 
So whereas death at one point was something that, as he said here, the master could gamble with and play with, it could be something that they choose for themselves. It could be something that they um, had some command over. Today, for us, it's all about survival. And I believe that this only gets compounded when we think of you know various marginalized communities that experience this at such a fantastic rate, like black people in the United States getting shot. Like every time, if I were a black person living in the house, I'd be thinking, is this it for me? It's like, is every moment I'm alive while I'm doing this like a gift? Should I just be like happy about that? Like what a sad state of being, but in many ways captures the reality of the situation. So in the face of an absolute event like 9-11, uh, it is important that we maintain it as an event. So if, if we bring it to, uh, if we explain it with various, you know, possible causes, we say it was, you know, radical Islamic terrorism that did it, or we say that it was X, Y, and Z groups that did it, or we say that it was uh, a conspiracy orchestrated by the U.S. government that did it, what we do then by doing that is remove the symbolic element behind it and we lose then a possibility of grasping our um, complacency and our commitment to a kind of new world order as Baudrillard says it or another word for globalization for totalizing you know western uh, authority throughout the world and instead supplant that with just another explainable easy narrative to consume because then it feeds on people's paranoias and people's fears and makes them more susceptible to crap, I think, to some extent, to lies and jargon. Because it has been really unfortunate where what this, um, what 9-11 resulted in was heightened security efforts, where that was the real success of uh, the, the, the attacks, was that people were not, are now under more we're under more surveillance and still are. And with every attack, this probably gets compounded. So for Baudrillard, that's, you know, that's not a good thing. But that is only the consequence of us failing to recognize that it is in fact this logic of security, but on a global level, that causes these types of events to occur, where there are always going to be these antagonistic forces that do not correspond to the same kind of logic. That is a logic of map ability, a logic of control, a logic of security that does not abide by that framework. You know, terrorism doesn't knock at the door. It fucking blows the door down, uh, not complying to that very logic. And it is by extension, uh, us or by extension, us applying that same surveillance, that same control to every single person is only going to result, I think this is what Baudrillard was predicting, uh, in more devastating and more, um, I guess, effective from one side, effective retaliations, which I think he has a, has a point about, although I don't know if we could really see it uh, happening. This has been, what, 2019, 18 years? I can't really think of a one on in the United States as bad as that wow i hope i'm not wrong about that uh but i'm also thinking about the rest of the world anyways okay i'm rambling so he concludes this book by in the last section by saying that current terrorism is not the descendant of a traditional history of anarchy nihilism and fanaticism it is contemporaneous with globalization, and in order to grasp its features, we should briefly go over a genealogy of that globalization in its relation to the universal and the singular. So in many ways, it's exactly what I've been saying the whole time. So the difference between universality and globalization is, is an important distinction, where he says that universality is the universality of human rights, freedoms, culture, and democracy. Globalization, on the other hand, is the globalization of technologies, the market, tourism, and information. So globalization is much more pernicious for Baudrillard because it's, um, it's, it's on the rise. And tourism and information really stand out to me. Like tourism is a, like a plague when it comes to, you know, um, 
ontological pluralism. When it comes down to recognizing otherness, Torism completely spits in the face of otherness, and we all become flanels, right? And by virtue of that, we become, you know, we just consume the, the other. We don't allow the other, or allow, not our choosing. Um, the other doesn't just exist, you know, they become an object of contemplation for us. So what is globalized are things like the market, as he said, uh, the profusion of exchanges and of the products and the perpetual flow of money. So universal values go away in that moment. So we can think here of Deleuze and Guattari, right? Where markets, you know, accommodate and they intensify and they commodify difference, whereas universalization wants to get rid of that difference. So there is something to be said here about the way that uh, capitalism works in tandem with this, but it also speaks to a broader project of, I, I think, you know, like epistemological paranoia, where we fear our own loss of our knowledge, so want it, we want it to be spread out everywhere. Uh, but because that looks so bad, you know, we found a new way to do it. We, we embrace the logic of, you know, the market, the logic of kind of the deterritorialized flows of becoming or whatever and then we can provide the image of ourselves as not being um kind of like fascist universalists but instead become global um cosmopolitan oppressors so hence then he says the violence of the global so the violence of a system that hounds out any form of negativity or singularity including that ultimate form of singularity that is death itself and then expels them or eradicates them, whatever is easier. And in the face of this, people people do recognize this occurring, but they often take it up in shitty ways. Just as you know, the conversation about terrorism is a conversation about uh, demonizing uh, Muslim people for the most part, when in fact you know the problem, according to Bojer, it has nothing to do with that. Uh, the same can be applied here to this thing called globalization, where then you have people like you know, nationalists or like the Alex Joneses of the world who say that, you know, the globalists are taking over the world. He's not incorrect. But by framing it like that, what he ends up doing is mistaking the the problem and mistaking the enemy. So for Baudrillard, who can thwart the global system, he asks? Certainly not the anti-globalization movement, whose only object is to curb deregulation. Its political impact may be considerable, but its symbolic impact is zero. So these anti-globalists uh, end up screwing everything up, right? Because especially in the case of the United States, they want more of the United States, right? They want more stuff made in the United States, more stuff uh, exported by the United States, anything like that, which doesn't get at the problem at all. It simply uh, mistakes the problem. So I guess in the wake of this, like what, what is it we have to do? Well, Baudrillard, Baudrillard says, to understand the rest of the world's hatred of the West, we have to overturn all our usual understandings or ways of seeing it. It is not the hatred of those for whom we have taken everything and given nothing back. It is the hatred of those to whom we have given everything without their being able to give it back. So this underpins or, or guides one of his earlier conversations in, in his work about um, the gift. So the gift runs all throughout his his work, I think. Well, not so much, but it comes up here and there, where he's interested in there always being an antagonism, So, I, which is what I've been saying here. But in the case of the gift, back with... Uh, Mouse, Mouse's theorization about it, there's always the ability to give a counter gift. And there is a necessity to maintain that, right? So there has to be a counter gift to be given back in order to make amends for that initial gift giving. So by giving a counter gift that doesn't satisfy, that isn't in the service of satisfying the person receiving the gift, 
it is actually an act by which the person giving the counter gift makes up for them having received the gift. So by allowing someone to give someone a counter gift, they make them feel a lot better to receive a counter gift. Anyway, so let's think of an example. Um, if I give someone, a friend of mine, $500, they're going to feel really, well, <laughs> I can't speak for everyone, but the idea here is that they're going to feel really bad if they are not able to return that gift with an equal or greater gift, whether it be in the form of the money back or, you know, some other kind of service or, or something else, uh, because then it's just like, um, it infantilizes that person, essentially, resting them from their ability to be autonomous subjects and making them, I guess, subordinate. One other way we can think about it is if anyone's ever gone out with their significant other and their parents, you know, I obviously can't generalize, but in my experience, it was always the father that would pay for dinner. And of course, there's a whole thing about, you know, they make the more money apparently and all that type of crap. But I think there's also something else going on, and that is that the act of giving the gift that isn't for the other people around. It is for the father to exert their domination or their dominance, their their place of superiority at the table. It's just one example. So if, you know, someone were to do that and then someone else at the table were to say, you know, actually, I'll pay for half of it, it undoes that power dynamic to some extent. It throws it, you know, under the bus or better yet if everyone else pays their part or as soon as the dinner's over uh someone buys that the father an equal gift of the equal value then suddenly that act loses its um, generous element and simply becomes a non-event a nothing oh god so what else a lot of the same really other here, I'll make you listen to me think. I think that's about it, really. I mean, I could go on and on, but I think that captures it. Uh, a very problematic book, obviously, but God, is it interesting, especially having read uh, his other texts. He makes many references to stuff he said earlier, and it's really interesting to see how they play out. In kind of a real world events because up till this point you know or throughout all of his work Baudrillard is not uh, often credited with being you know a very clear thinker and oftentimes you know I'd find myself reading his stuff thinking like okay you know so what where when does this happen is why are you describing this and then he's bringing these things up when these events occur and saying look this is how you know the expulsion of death applies here, and this is why it works in favor of a certain power, or anything like that, or symbolic exchange, or anything. So, you know, this is all this is me saying, go out and read all of his books, which you should, but or don't. I don't know. Just, I don't because I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. So other people should, you know, make up their opinions for themselves. But on that note, if I said anything that people disagree with. Uh, in terms of what Baudrillard says or for any other reason. I'd love to hear it. But on that note, 